Thank you for the introduction. So this is a joint work with Giuseppe Regnese and David Nunes de Venturi, and uh, I'm going to introduce matchmaking encryption, this new type of uh, encryption scheme. And uh, before seeing the scheme, let's start with an analogy with the real world. So let's talk about a live drop. And uh, you also have seen this technique in movies and allows basically spies to share secret information. Uh, suppose that it's an organization composed by people. Uh, their identities are secret, but the only thing that you know is their job. So there are detectives, spies, ninjas, and so on. So, far. so let's assume now that there is a detective that needs to give a top secret information to the ninja. So a way to do that is the live drop. They choose a public place, they meet there. So the detective knows that he's looking for a ninja, and the ninja is looking for a detective. And when they meet, basically, the detective can give this uh, top secret information to the other party. So it's called live because both parties need to interact and at the same time. And uh, from a cryptographic point of view, there is a scheme that implements a, such, such a live drop that is called secret handshake. It's a key exchange protocol. There is an authority that is uh, basically responsible to generate keys for the parties, and the keys contains the attributes of the corresponding party. So for example, the detective has the key for the attributes detective. That's what the authority does. And uh, then uh, the protocol can start. So for example, the detective chooses a policy on the fly, and the policy is a description that the attributes of the party must satisfy. So the, the party does some cryptographic operation using the key and the policy and send a message to the other party. The other party da, does the same, send back the message, and the property is that they share a secure channel if both policies are satisfied, so there is a mutual match. Secret Asia has some properties that the straightforward, the, 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 the intuitive one is the impersonator resistant that basically says that it's impossible to impersonate another person. So if I'm a ninja and I have uh, the attributes for ninja, I cannot pretend to be a detective because I need the corresponding key for the attributes. And the second one is called detector resistant that is a somewhat a privacy guarantee. So suppose that the protocol fails, so at least one of the two policies has not been satisfied, then it's impossible to determine which of the two. And this gives uh, privacy guarantees because if I choose the policy ninja, I cannot say that the other party is a ninja or no because I don't know if my policy is satisfied. So there is another technique that was used that is called that drop, and uh, basically it's a non-interactive live drop. So now instead of a public place, there is a secret spot that both party knows, so the detective goes there, sees the rock that they also the other party knows, and put the top secret information under this rock, and then leaves. So at some point, the ninja will come, sees the rock, and takes back the, um, the top secret information. So uh, a cryptographic scheme that implements a dead drop uh, must be seen as a non-interactive uh, secret handshake, so an encryption scheme that has the same property of secret handshake. And this is what it is, uh, matchmaking encryption. So at that level, uh, there is an authority, again, that generates the keys for the party that contains the attributes. But it's also responsible to generate an additional decryption key that contains the policy of the receiver. And then the sender can encrypt by choosing a policy on the fly, using the encryption key for his attributes, the policy, and the message, produce a ciphertext. And the receiver can uh, decrypt by using the, the, the keys. So the keys for the attributes, the key for the policy, and the property is the usual one. So if there is a mood of match, so both are satisfied, then the receiver can retrieve the message. At that level, the algorithms are the following. There is the setup algorithm that generates the master public key, the master secret key, and the master secret key is used by the authority to generate the keys. Then there are two key gen algorithms. One is for the sender, so it's responsible to generate the encryption key for the attributes for the sender side. And there is the one for the receiver that generates the decryption key for the attributes of the receiver. There is the third algorithm to generate key, the key for the policy, so the decryption key that contains the policy. And then there are the standard encryption and decryption algorithm. So the first one takes the encryption key for the attributes, the policy on the fly, and the message, and produces a ciphertext. And uh, the decryption takes the two keys, so one for the attributes, one for the policy, the ciphertext, and, and returns either the message or an error. 
So as I told you, matchmaking encryption is a non-interactive secret handshake, so must guarantee the same property that secret handshake has. Uh, for this reason, we define two game-based definitions for to capture these properties. The first one is called match security and incorporates at the same time the CPA security of the encryption scheme together with detector resistance. So here the attacker is the, send, the receiver, has Oracle access to the key gen algorithms, and uh, during the game at some point produces two challenges, and each challenge contains the, the input of the encryption algorithm, so the attributes, the policy, and the message of the sender. Uh, as, uh, the challenger, uh, choosing one of the two, encrypts it, and uh, the objective is to guess the bit bit. So it's clear that this is a CPA security definition because the, the receiver, so the attacker, can choose two messages and uh, also has Oracle access to the sender key gen, so can ask for encryption key and generates the corresponding ciphertext. But note also that basically the attacker can choose everything, so can choose the attributes of the sender, the policy, and also the, the policy and the attributes of the receiver by making Oracle uh, queries to the key gen algorithms. So we have a, a definition of valid adversary. And uh, what basically says that since the adversary can choose everything, can produce a match or a mismatch, and if, produ if the attacker produces a mismatch, what we ask is that uh, basically uh, both challenge lies in one of these characteristics. Each challenge lies on this category, one of these categories, so it's a mismatch. And uh, note that they, they, do, doesn't, they don't need to be on the same class. They, for example, the first challenge could be a mismatch of this type, while the second one of this type. And this implies that we have detector resistance because we are implicitly saying that these cases are indistinguishable. And uh, in the definition, there is also an additional case, that the case where the, the attacker has a match. So it can actually retrieve the messages. The message, so we ask the attacker to put two messages that are equal in the challenge phase. So this definition is the, um, captures the um, CPA security definition and the detector resistant, but we are still missing the impersonator resistant. So we have a second uh, definition that is called authenticity. Now the attacker is the sender, has Oracle access to the KeyGen algorithm, and what the attacker needs to do is to produce a ciphertext that correctly decrypts under a policy and uh, without having the corresponding key. So without having a key for some attributes that match the policy. So matchmaking encryption has policies, has attributes. So the first question is what is the relation with attribute-based encryption? So there are mainly, mainly two attribute-based encryption. The, the first one is called server policy. So where the sender uses the policy, chooses a policy on the fly and encrypts the message and the decryption key of the receiver contains the attributes. And there is the opposite that is called key policy. Now the sender chooses the attributes on the fly and the, the decryption key contains the policy. So matchmaking encryption implies cyber policy ABE because the only thing that we have to do is to ignore the policy of the receiver and this can be done by setting the policy to a tautology, so a formula that is always satisfied. And uh, matchmaking encryption also implies uh, key policy IB if you don't need authenticity, because first of all, we can ignore the policy of the sender using the same technique, but still, as you can see, there is a, there is a difference because the, um, the sender has an encryption key for the attributes. Uh, why this is, uh, why the, we need an encryption key? Because we want authenticity, but of course, if we don't need authenticity, these attributes can be chosen on the fly. And we have key policy IB. There is a third case, a uh, third uh, type of attribute-based encryption that is called dual policy. Uh, now there are two policies, and the one of the receiver is containing the decryption key together with the attributes. And in this case, uh, the two schemes remain incomparable because the main difference is that dual policy is a single key, while matchmaking encryption has two, and in matchmaking encryption, if uh, the receiver has multiple keys, it can interleave them, and this is not possible in dual policy. And moreover, if you don't care about the, the decryption key, the, the, the problem of dual policy is that it doesn't achieve match security because it's always possible to see if a policy is satisfied or not. So now, 
we are going to see how we can build matchmaking encryption. And at that level, uh, this is what is the workflow of the decryption algorithm. So it has to check if both policies are satisfied. If this is true, then retard the message, otherwise there's an, uh, an error. So the first question is why we don't build matchmaking encryption for attribute-based encryption? Because we have separate policy and key policy, maybe we can use both to have matchmaking. And uh, let's forget for the moment about authenticity. So, so let's assume that we want a matchmaking encryption scheme that attributes are choosing on the fly. A way to do that is to encrypt, use the key policy IB to first encrypt the message, and then encrypt the, again the ciphertext with the cipher policy IB. So now we have two decryption keys, one for the attributes, that is the decryption key of cipher policy IB, so we can remove the layer on the decryption phase, and we can use the second key, one the one for the policy, to remove the last layer and retrieve the message. So from a syntactical, a syntactical point of view, this looks like a matchmaking encryption scheme, but the problem is that it uh, doesn't achieve match security, and I gave you the intuition before, because basically an, an attribute-based encryption scheme is responsible only to handle a single policy, and when that policy is not satisfied, basically it returns an error message. So the error message gives us the, um, the information that the policy is not satisfied. So in this example, basically, when we try to, for example, to decrypt the first layer, uh, we retrieve the, the error message, we know that the policy is not satisfied. And in, uh, in details, these two cases, so the one that the policy of the sender is not satisfied and the one of the receiver, yes, and the opposite, are always distinguishable. And these are two cases of the match uh, security definition. So this gives us the intuition that in order to have matchmaking, to implement matchmaking encryption, we need to check that both policies are satisfied atomically. Otherwise, it's impossible to have a match security. And uh, from the theoretical point of view, we have two results. We are able to build matchmaking encryption from uh, randomized functional encryption, signature and non-interrupted zero knowledge. And we have, uh, we have a second result where uh, we replace the randomized functional encryption scheme with a two input functional, functional encryption. So we can trade the randomization of the function with a two input function. So let's see the, the first result. What is a functional encryption scheme? There are decryption keys for functions. Is it possible to encrypt a message using a public key? And uh, the property is that when we decrypt using the decryption key, what we obtain is the evaluation of the function with input the encrypted message. And the, guarantee, the security guarantee is that nothing is leaked except the output of the function. There is the, rando the randomized version, uh, basically is the same, where the function now is randomized. So when we decrypt, we evaluate, we evaluate the function with some fresh randomness. So how we build matchmaking encryption? We use two functions. One is randomized and one is deterministic. The randomized one has uh, are coded the attributes of the receiver and takes in input the attributes of the sender, the policy, and the message. And this function uh, checks the, the, if, the policy is if the sender's policy is satisfied. If this is true, uh, re-encrypts the attributes of the, the, the sender and the message using the, encryption, the encryption algorithm of functional encryption. Otherwise, uh, re-encrypts encrypt, uh, through error messages using the same uh, encryption algorithm. Then we have a, a second function that has coded now the policy of the receiver takes in input the attributes of the sender and the, the message, so what the previous function encrypts, and, does the, and checks the, the, the if the policy of the receiver is satisfied. If it is true, retard the message, otherwise it's not an error. So basically, what we are doing here is we are using two different functions to check the two policies, and uh, we, are, um, we are passing information to the second function in an encrypted fashion in order to don't leak any information, and this allows to check uh, both policies in an atomic way. So just to conclude, basically, the decryption key for the attributes will be the decryption key for, of the randomized functional encryption scheme, and the decryption key of the policy will be the decryption key of, fun of the functional encryption scheme. So this construction, as it is, uh, allows us to have match security, but still we miss uh, authenticity. And uh, how we achieve that is we use a, a signature non interactive zero knowledge. At that level, basically, the signature is uh, used by the authorities to certify that the party has the, possessed that attributes. 
So the signature will be the encryption key. And then we use non-interactive zero knowledge to prove that the attributes that are encrypting here are attributes that the party possess. So it knows a signature that correctly verifies under these uh, attributes. And uh, we, why we need zero knowledge? Because uh, we need to don't leak any information about the attributes, because otherwise, any information uh, about the attributes can uh, give us the, um, can reveal if a policy is satisfied or not. So we, we don't have much security. So uh, I'll mention some of the results that we, you can find on the paper. We have an implementation of uh, an identity-based version. So basically, attributes and policies are binary string, and the policy is satisfied if uh, the two strings are equal. We put forward, uh, we, we define the definitions, and uh, we are able to build uh, this uh, identity-based version from the bilinear Diffie-Hellman assumption and the random oracle. Then uh, we, uh, we implemented an anonymous balloting board that used uh, identity-based matchmaking encryption to allow parties to post and retrieve messages according to their interests and protect their privacy by the match security definition, uh, the match uh, property. And uh, lastly, we have a, an alternative version of matchmaking encryption where now instead of having two keys, we have a single key that incorporates together the attributes and the policy, like in dual policy IB, and uh, still we have the match security definition with the authenticity definition, and uh, in this case, we are able to build a scheme from uh, directly from functional encryption, signature, no interactive zero knowledge. So you can find the detail on the, on the paper, on the full version, and uh, that's it. So thank you, and I'm happy to ask, answer your question. If you have a question, please come to the microphone. We have a lot of time for questions. Yeah, uh, sufficient for what you need. It seems that uh, Sorry? predicate encryption instead of functional encryption would it be sufficient for what you need? It seems like you only need security in the case where things don't decrypt, which is usually much easier. Well, uh, the problem is that uh, we need two policies, so we we will need two predicate encryption, right? And the problem is that uh, how you how you merge these two schemes, because if you're using a naive way like we use uh, attribute-based encryption, we don't, you don't have uh, match security, that's the problem. So you need like, uh, uh, an, like uh, a wrapper of the two scheme that doesn't leak any information about the predicate, that's the problem. So I don't think it's sufficient. More questions? So I have a question. Uh, do you have uh, any intuition uh, whether we can prove that it is impossible to achieve matchmaking encryption uh, from uh, attribute-based encryption in the black box way? Or uh, we don't have uh, such result. I mean, it's an intuition. OK. Uh, if, you, if you don't assume any additional assumption, so uh, and a third scheme on an additional assumption, the intuition is that it's not possible because uh, it's hard to combine the two schemes That's the, and have match security. Mm. I mean, I don't have the impossibility result, but that's just an intuition. Okay, okay, thanks. More questions? Yeah, let's, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>